bread. You know, isn't it kind of curious that on the day that I was going to announce to the class that I saw Jojo Rabbit, guess who's not here? Huh? Jojo. Meanwhile, the railroad during this decade also moves to the economic center. At, in 1850, we only have 9,000 miles of track. By 1860, we have more than 30,000 miles of track laid. Indeed, by 1852, uh, Stephen Douglas had arranged it so that the North-South uh, Intercontinental Rail is connected from Chicago down to New Orleans. By 1855, uh, Chicago is connected to the East City, uh, the East Coast. So it's a central transport hub. And because now you have all this dependable transportation, agriculture, mining, manufacturing is all expanding. Now, of course, there were difficulties faced, like the differing gauge. Like by this time, Pennsylvania had replaced all of its mainline canal stuff with railroads. And because they were afraid that the New York Erie rail line would come in and try to use their track, they had that different gauge, which is the distance between the tracks. Also, there had to be bridges help, but government at all levels help. Now, wait a minute. Why would government at all levels help? Okay, okay. I'm going to bring it down a little bit. What big, huge national headquarters did Plano just get? Toyota, toy motor, all right? They got Toyota. They got money from the state. I don't know how much they got from the state in the billions. From Plano, Plano gave them like uh, $20 million. They're not going to have to pay taxes for seven years. Plano is going to carry, the, not only did they donate the land, but they're going to carry the cost of making sure that roads are built out to it, that uh, rail lines are built out to it, that it has access. That costs a lot of money. Why is, Toy why is Plano doing that? Because it creates business risk. What do you mean? Because more people move here because people have to get a job at Toyota. That's right. He, he's Toyota. He's not paying taxes, but you, the employee, you are. You're going to need a place to live. Oh, you're going to have to live in one of our apartments. Oh, wait a minute. We don't have enough affordable apartments. So we're going to have to hire your construction company to build more apartments. We're going to have to buy through you because you're a real estate agent. And so we're going to have to use you. When you finally do get your apartment, you're going to use the electric company, the water company. Uh, you're going to go to the racetrack by you to get gasoline. You're going to have to, because you know, you're not working all the time. You're going to have to go to her place to buy clothes. You're going to have to go to her place to buy food. Oh, and by the way, all these places are getting more and more employees doing that. So they're going to need more and more workers. Oh, and by the way, you're going to go to the movies. You might go to that restaurant. You might go. Opportunity creates opportunity creates opportunity. Indeed, uh, whatever, that I think they figured out that today, the money that we spent on building the interstate highway system and that began in 1956 has already, through taxes and economics and everything like that, has already repaid for itself more than 30 times. Okay? Hey, hey, hey. Also, during this time, the West... Their economic and political power increases. You have grain prices on the rise. With new farming equipment. Making sowing and reaping even more bountiful harvests possible. <clears throat> Our immigration still basically from Ireland and Germany, is increasing. So the labor force is expanding. But guys, remember, we're trying to play the American system, where the cotton of the South goes to feed the industry of the North, the food of the West goes to feed the North and the South, 
and the goods of the north go back to the west and the south so that people have clean clothes. All of this, though, has created a sectional division that is driving more and more fissures between the different sections of our nation. And I know a lot of you are excited and want to do research, uh, but put away your phones, please. Put away your phone, please. Now, guys, you have the, I mean, the Whig Party is just getting weaker and weaker. Uh, they're trying to build up their numbers by attracting new members by going to um, immigrants, which, of course, the artisans and the Protestants within the Whig Party totally take umbrage at this. these guys start leaving the Whigs, they go to the American Party. Now, this party is also called the Know Nothing Party, as in K-N-O-W-N-O-T-H-I-N-G. Why is it called the Know Nothing Party? Because when they had like a party meeting, uh, the guy who was leading the meeting would say, okay, listen, don't tell the press anything about what we talked about in here. So when they were leaving the meetings, uh, you know, the press would go, so what did you talk about in there? They, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, I don't know anything. Ah, no nothing, eh? <laughs> Basically, these guys were anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic. But the reasons why they were varied from region to region. Like northern know-nothings believed that the southern slaveholders and Catholic agents were conspiring to destroy liberal republicanism and free enterprise. Southern know-nothings, however, believed that immigrants who had fled oppression in Europe would automatically support reform movements, including abolitionism. Here you see some, uh, some uh, popular cartoons that, or political cartoons. Here's Irish whiskey, or the Irish Im uh, immigrant, uh, lager beer, or the German immigrant. They're stealing away with the ballot box while we're all fighting amongst ourselves over here. Or I love this. This is a poorhouse from Galway. Galway, G-A-L-W-A-Y. It's a section in Ireland. That's where the Scottish part of my family actually came from Galway. Then it became Galloway. Uh, here it says the balance of the trade with Great Britain uh, still seems to be against us. Because they're just sending us their poor. And about this time, a book comes out that is incredibly popular and brings a new impetus to the anti-slavery movement. It's Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. At first it was published in serial form in an anti-slavery paper called The National Era, but it was first printed as a book in 1852, only sold uh, 3,000 copies, but within five years, they turned it into a morality play, and it had sold half a million copies. Even though Harriet Beecher Stowe only visited one slave state, Kentucky, she didn't talk to a single slave. She talked to somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, but that doesn't matter. She wrote a story, indeed, when Abraham, and she's a short little, I think she was like 4'8" at the tallest. When Abraham Lincoln, who was like 6'4", meets her, you know, he's a huge giant of a man, he meets her and he says, so you're the little lady that started this big war. Well, in reaction, in response to the uh, fugitive slave law, a lot of people in the North to rebel against it, they started the Underground Railroad, 
which basically was taking people from safe house to safe house until they were eventually either out of the country up in Canada or in our case here in Texas down in Mexico. One of the people who led more than 300 escaped slaves to freedom was Harriet Tubman. 